Marlene Desjardins. Let me read to you her response when we emailed her to ask her if she'd be willing to do a webinar on psychoeducational assessments for our organization. She wrote back, I would love to do the webinar. It's actually something I've been wanting to do for a while now, but have not had the chance to do. So the opportunity you're presenting to me is great. What an enthusiastic response we got. And that's why we keep asking her back. This is not her first time presenting with us. Marlene is a licensed school psychologist who completed her PhD in school and child clinical psychology from OISE, part of the University of Toronto. She has worked with children and adolescents with learning disorders for over 17 years, much of it at the Montreal Fluency Centre, a not-for-profit centre offering speech, language, learning and literacy services. Marlene is no stranger to psychoeducational assessments, as that is how she spends a significant portion of her time at the center. She brings to her assessment work a strong desire to help students and their parents' guardians understand the student's learning profile and use this understanding to help the student achieve their full potential. To do this, Marlene draws from theory and research on assessment and report writing. Marlene also directs the Taylor Adolescent. We know it better. An after-school intervention for middle school and high school students who have learning disorders. Here, her knowledge of assessment helps with providing appropriate intervention to students with identified learning disorders, as well as monitoring their progress in the program. Marlene began preparation for her presentation by responding to a list of frequently asked questions we provided her. However, I am certain that during the presentation and also at the end of it, you will have additional questions that you'd like to ask. Marlene is certainly well positioned to answer many, if not all of these questions. So normally I would say without further ado, we'll give you the floor, but there is no floor. <laughs> so we're gonna give you the webcam, Marlene. Thank and you. I hope everybody has a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. That was a really lovely introduction. <laughs> um, and I hope I can live up to it. Um, so as Alice said, um, I mean, yes, I have done a lot of uh, work in the area of learning disorders, assessment and intervention. Um, I'm hoping that I have prepared some stuff that will address most questions, but I certainly am happy to keep things a little bit informal and for people to jump in um, if you have questions about stuff that I'm presenting on. Um, and certainly I've kept a good chunk of time at the end um, in anticipation of people having questions that they want to ask um, that I may not have been able to address properly with what I've put together for tonight. So, okay, so here we have the first glitch of being on Zoom is my presentation is not actually moving. Um, Marlene, are you using a Mac? No, I'm on a PC. And normally I just hit one of the arrow keys and it goes to the next slide. Are you in full screen? Sometimes I find it easier but not in full screen. I am in full screen. Thank you. I think that was Linda's voice. It was. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I will see if I can get out of full screen. Which doesn't seem to be one. Hit escape. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, okay. Now I'm completely out of full screen. I was just going to mention perhaps hitting the space bar or the enter. We'll switch the slide for you when you're in full screen. It's just a thought. Okay. Or try per second. What happens if you hit from current slide? Oh, yeah, from beginning. Oh, no, that worked. The enter worked. Thank you, Roberta. 
Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> I thought it was so well prepared. Um, so now I look like a liar because Alice said I had 17 plus years of experience and I wrote 20 years of experience doing assessments. I think there were a few extra years in there between masters and PhDs. So we'll we'll squeeze those ones in. Um, but basically, I wanted to give you a little bit of background as to who I am. Um, so I'll add a few details to what Alice already told you. Um, because I do think it's important to know the perspective that I'm coming from in addressing the topic of psychoeducational assessments. It's always helpful, I think, for people to know kind of the bias of their uh, presenter um, so that you can take that into account as you listen to me and evaluate for yourself what you think. Um, and so basically, I have worked in different environments, although I will say that most of my assessment experience has been in uh, the I guess the private sector, but the not-for-profit community organization sector. Um, so although there's fee-for-service, we're definitely all about making services as accessible to the people who need it most. Um, and so there's fundraising and bursaries that we're able to offer to families who are experiencing financial constraints. Um, but it is a, a different kind of perspective to be coming from. I don't work in the school board system, um, so I don't know the reality of assessing um, as a psychologist, a school psychologist in the public sector. Um, I have had a little bit of experience in that domain, um, but it's been a number of years. So I do think that um, that's important to take into consideration. Um, and one of the things that I've had the you know, good fortune to be able to do in the last certainly about 15 or so years of my career is to do assessments with um, speech language pathologists. I work at a center where most of my colleagues are speech language pathologists, and that has been a really valuable opportunity um, to do something that's collaborative and ultimately for many of our clients actually is the best kind of assessment to do. So it be, it's a bit broader than just a, a psychoeducational assessment. Um, and I think it's also important to, to know that I am clinical director of the Taylor Adolescent Program, and I've been in the program having started as a tutor mentor. Um, it's got to be about 26 or 27 years now. Um, I was not altogether that young when I started, so now I'm, I'm revealing a lot about my age. Um, but I think it's important to know that I do have not just the assessment side um, of psychoeducational assessments, but also an intervention side, which really is kind of the outcome one hopes of a psychoeducational assessment, that you can take that information and use it in some way to help the student. And, and of course, having that experience doing intervention can inform how we do an assessment and also the kinds of recommendations that we make. So I just wanted to highlight those two parts of my own development and experience. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of what we're going to do tonight, um, I think in the next hour or so, I will talk about what uh, an assessment might, uh, why an assessment might be needed, um, who does assessments, um, a little bit about what an assessment looks like. Uh, and I think at any of these points, people probably will have some more specific questions and things that they'd like to know about that I might not have anticipated. Um, I think importantly, people want to know what those scores actually mean. How do I understand the results of a psychoeducational assessment um, so that I can feel comfortable and confident with this information and use it to support my child going forward? Um, and how does the information from an assessment actually help my child? What are some of the positive outcomes that can come out of doing an assessment? And as I said, we'll end off with, um, I hope, ample time to do some questions and answers and a little bit more discussion. Um, I think for tonight, I also wanted to point out that I am focusing on psychoeducational assessments. Um, some of you, depending on whether your child is in the French uh, or English school systems here, may be more familiar with neuropsych assessments. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the two, but my own training and what I, I do in my career is psychoeducational assessments. So I'll be focusing my discussion around that. Uh, and that's the one that really, you know, is mostly used in the English system, I think, um, from what I understand uh, from colleagues who work in the French system and from just some of the work that I've done with different families, neuropsych assessment tends to be more the norm in the French system here. So I thought it was important to just point that out. And really, in terms of um, being trained as a school psychologist, I think it lends itself really well to being able to do a good psychoeducational assessment. 
in part because the training that we receive really allows us to look at a whole child. Um, we're not just looking at brain functioning or intelligence. We're not just looking at academic skills, both of which are really important, but they don't make up the whole child. Um, children have temperaments and personalities and likes and dislikes and a whole lot of other factors that I think need to come into play when we're looking at um, a psychoeducational assessment and how to interpret results and also how to move forward with that information. So it's really like the training that I've had and the people who've mentored me and uh, supervised me over the years have enabled me to develop all of those skills. Um, and I think those are really important in, in being able to do a good psychoeducational assessment. So um, moving on to what might an assessment, why might an assessment be needed? And hopefully this is now gonna work. Okay, good. So I think one of the first reasons or things that come up that suggest that an assessment may be needed is that your child is struggling in school. Um, someone has noticed it might be you, it might be as a parent or guardian, it may be a teacher or someone at school, but someone has noticed um, that the child is engaged in having some difficulty with some aspect of school. That could be a particular subject area. Um, it could be just being a wiggly kid in a seat at school. Um, it could be, you know, any number of things along those lines. And, um, you know, that might be the reason why an assessment would be needed is to be able to figure out what is going on and to make sense out of what is being observed. Um, sometimes parents have a gut feeling, um, even before teachers bring anything up or notice anything in, in the school or in the classroom, um, parents sometimes just have a gut feeling that something doesn't seem right. And you've got questions that are coming to mind. Um, that would be a good reason to do a psychoeducational assessment to investigate more of what's going on. Sometimes Parents will, you know, say things like, oh, you know, I just think my kid is unmotivated. They just aren't that interested in school or they're lazy. They're just not trying, you know, those are usually keywords for me that perhaps there's an attention issue going on. Um, a lot of kids who turn out to have an attention deficit um, are often, were often described before that assessment and diagnosis as lazy or unmotivated or things along those lines. Um, difficult in some way. Um, so I think just anything that signals that the kid is not having an easy time in school, and that is making people wonder. Um, and again, as a parent or guardian, I would encourage you to trust your gut. Um, parents often do have a feeling that something isn't going properly or as it should. And I think when that happens, follow your gut. Um, and even if it's just an initial consultation, there's no need to kind of commit to a whole psychoeducational assessment, but it's a good, you know, it's something to, to consider, certainly. And sometimes parents are wondering, like, how does my child learn best? You know, what kind of a learner is he or she? Um, this is something that doesn't come up so, so often, but I've certainly had it come up in my career. Parents are sometimes just wondering, you know, should my child go to French school or English school? Um, what kind of a school situation might they benefit most from in terms of learning? And so it becomes really wondering about how the child learns best and needing to seek out some kind of a psychoeducational assessment to gather information that will help them know what kind of a learning environment might be the best for their child, might be a good match. This sometimes comes up for elementary school. It certainly comes up, I'd say, even more frequently for high school. I, I will often get parents wanting to do an assessment to figure out high school placement and some of the considerations that they should be looking into in order to decide on an ideal high school learning environment for their child. Um, the other, actually, the other things in terms of, you know, how a child learns best that can come up um, have to do with things like sometimes children when they're very young, it's clear that they're precocious in some ways. They're very interested in books. Maybe they're starting to read a few words or look at things in their environment and recognize certain symbols. And so they're already showing some inclination to start reading before they've even started formal schooling. 
Um, maybe the daycare educator is saying things like the kid is, you know, seems to be advanced compared to the other kids in the group and they, they've got to give the child some challenging things to work on to keep them engaged and, and whatnot. So some parents then are wondering, and this is particularly true when they just miss a cutoff to be able to start kindergarten. Um, so maybe they have an October or an early November birthday. And so parents might be wondering then, well, should I be derogating my child? Should I be getting them into school early given that they just missed the cutoff? So sometimes that's another piece of this kind of wondering how my child learns best and what's gonna be ideal for them moving forward. Um, and so a derogation assessment, I mean, a psychoeducational assessment to be able to apply for derogation is certainly something that we do. Um, English eligibility is another thing um, that sometimes comes up and that comes back to, hmm, should my child be in an English school setting, in a French school setting? Um, you know, we're not sure um, what's going to be best and, and um, you know, allow my child to flourish. We see some things maybe that are making us wonder this uh, in spite of being in whatever bilingual environment they might be in. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons why parents might be wondering about how their child learns. Um, another example that sometimes comes up are students who are on the spectrum and already have had an assessment that's led to that diagnosis. Um, but parents now, as the child is more school age or entering high school, are wondering, well, aside from the fact that my child has, you know, is on the spectrum and has some of the difficulties we know to be associated with that, what is it, I want to know more about just how they learn and what it is that I'm going to need to do to support them moving forward. Um, knowing that they've got some of the, the challenges that go along with being on the spectrum. So I think wondering how my child learns best is, is a fairly, I mean, it's not an infrequent thing that comes up when we're talking about why an assessment might be necessary and helpful. Certainly, as I was saying a moment ago, we sometimes, you know, think about um, some children as, you know, being super wiggly or um, looking like they just have difficulty being able to sustain focused attention, anything of that nature. And we're wondering, does my child have ADHD? Sometimes this actually comes up in my practice when kids are preschoolers, which is always like, a difficult situation for me because we could technically do an assessment, but we also have to recognize that you know preschoolers are sometimes just really wiggly and that can be developmentally typical. Um, but uh, certainly, if you know if a concern is a child having an attention problem or hyperactivity impulsivity, that would be a good reason um, to signal the need for a psychoeducational assessment. Sometimes the school is saying, you know, we see that there are some things going on. We want to be able to support your child. Um, we want, as a result, to be able to create an individual education plan, an IEP. And um, for some schools, uh, both, well, for some elementary schools, not all elementary schools, um, but most high schools for sure, require a psychoeducational assessment in order to create an individual education plan. Um, they need to be able to document what it is that they're um, providing to a student in terms of accommodations and resources. Um, they need to know what to put in as goals in the IEP uh, and maybe methods specifically that they're going to use to help that child achieve those goals. Uh, and so a psychoeducational assessment can be really relevant and helpful for that. And then finally, my child needs accommodations and or resources at school. So aside from an IEP, sometimes, you know, children just need to have accommodations. They need to have extra time to be able to do tests and exams. They need to uh, be able to write their tests in a separate room, um, you know, or sometimes even in a room alone so that there is no distraction from noise or other, you know, people being around. Um, Anything of that nature requires documentation in order to um, support that request and to, for those accommodations and sometimes for those resources to be provided by the school. And I think, you know, it can be a little bit frustrating um, sometimes, I think, for parents um, because it feels like an extra step to have to maybe do a psychoeducational assessment when it's very clear sometimes what a child does need. But schools actually their their files can be audited um, there are 
uh, there's a system in place whereby the government, the Ministry of Education, can come in and audit files and make sure that kids who are on a list as getting accommodations have the proper documentation in place to warrant um, those accommodations. And, uh, and so sometimes it's a little bit of an administrative you know, concern or issue, um, but it is definitely a reason why an assessment might be needed for a student. And sometimes it's a combination of these different um, factors. So these are all possible reasons or causes um, for doing a psychoeducational assessment. One thing I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I'm, I'm covering everything that I wanted to cover in this um, is uh, it's interesting because, you know, we're, I'm saying my child and I'm assuming it's a parent or guardian who's, you know, maybe having some of these thoughts or concerns or questions and maybe wanting to seek out a psychoeducational assessment. But it's interesting, sometimes high school students or young adults in SAJAP um, will say to their parent, you know, I, I'm really having a hard time paying attention or I can't stay focused in class. And so sometimes they're the ones who are saying, I think I might have something. Um, and I certainly have had high school students who've um, voiced, you know, questions or concerns to their parent about their learning experiences. And it's the kid, the this, this student, him or herself, who becomes kind of the referral source and talks to the parent and the parent, bless them, is, you know, is able to hear that and take it seriously and, and actually seek out um, either a consultation or move straight into a psychoeducational assessment. So it's not always actually an adult who's, who's you know, coming up with these questions and um, wanting the assessment itself. So I know sometimes people are wondering who does assessments. Um, well, as we all know now, school psychologists definitely do psychoeducational assessments. Um, clinical psychologists as well um, are able to do them. And uh, I certainly know some clinical psychologists who've had assessment training um, and, and who do psychoeducational assessments. Neuropsychologists um, definitely do a form of assessment. I, I don't think that they would call it a psychoeducational assessment because they are neuropsychologists and are therefore able to do a neuropsychological assessment. Um, but sometimes, and particularly here in the province of Quebec, um, the neuropsychological assessment and the school uh, or the educational assessment, psychoeducational assessment look quite similar. They actually use a lot of the same standardized measures a lot of the same assessment procedures, the write up of the report might be a little bit different, but there's a lot of overlap. And I do know many neuropsychologists um, and certainly within the French system, as I said earlier, it looks as though it's a more frequently used form of assessment to identify learning disorders and attention difficulties um, and to be able to know how to support students moving forward. So they definitely do an assessment that would be very similar um, and very appropriate, I think, under certain circumstances. Um, guidance counselors, actually, I know a few guidance counselors who do psychoeducational assessments at the high school level. Um, so that's definitely an option. And, you know, within the school system, if a student is able to get an assessment there, uh, of course, that's often quite helpful and, I mean, certainly more cost effective. Um, but it's also nice that it's being done within the, the school or the classroom kind of, you know, educational context. Um, so that the guidance counselor will often be able to speak with teachers. And I, I think there's just a different way to be able to gather some really important and relevant information. That's a little bit trickier for me to do as someone who works outside of the, the school system. On the French side, of course, they have uh, professionals, um, orthopedagogues, who have training in, in assessment. Um, I wrote academic assessment. I'm, I don't think that they do psychoeducational assessments. I'm not sure that they're able to actually administer a test of uh, general intelligence, for instance, um, but they certainly are trained in assessment. They can do academic assessments and probably some other things related to learning in the classroom. Um, and I think that's a great thing to be able to have. And unfortunately, it's just something we don't have on the English side. It's really only on the French side. Um, but on the English side, we certainly, of course, have resource teachers who could do academic assessments. Um, I, I think there probably are some who do. Um, and on the private side, I know uh, there are learning specialists who work in some of the private schools who will do academic assessments. 
um, and be able to gather some information that uh, certainly in my experience anyways has been really helpful in doing a psychoeducational assessment. So there, there are some variations there, but certainly um, a number of different professionals and paraprofessionals who can do an assessment or participate in a psychoeducational assessment. And ideally, I think having more than one person sometimes working on an assessment for a student can be really helpful because you get different perspectives. And I think sometimes a, a nice breadth of information that can be helpful. Okay, so I don't want to rush things too much. Um, but if there are no questions at this point, then I will keep going. So what does an assessment look like? Um, so there, there are basically all assessments, uh, psychoeducational, neuropsychological, will follow the same general sort of format. Um, I will speak more from my own experience and the way that I do a, a psychoeducational assessment, but just know that for the most part, these components are, are in all of these kinds of assessments and by any clinical psychologist, neuropsychologist, psycho, uh, school psychologist, they would all follow the same sort of procedure. Typically, it would begin with an initial discussion with the parent or guardian. Um, this is actually a really important step in, in an assessment process. Um, and this, of course, is after a referral has happened. So sometimes, again, it's the parent seeking out an assessment. Sometimes the parent is seeking it out on behalf of their child who has expressed concerns or questions that the parent feels should be addressed and that the psychoeducational assessment will be able to do that. Um, sometimes it's the school making the suggestion that there's uh, an assessment that needs to happen and the parent is following through on that. So really that's part of what needs to happen in that initial discussion, regardless of how the referral came, ultimately, at least in this, um, the setting that I work in, which is at the Montreal Fluency Center and in many private practice type settings, we're going to want to start with a conversation with parents and sometimes the student, depending on the student's age. Um, partly initially just to clarify what are the questions that have prompted this assessment or what are the concerns. Um, having a very good understanding of what it is that people are wondering about helps with planning the assessment beyond the kind of standard parts that any assessment would include. So definitely wanting to get an understanding of who's making this referral um, and why. Um, what are the specific questions, if there are any, sometimes parents will come and they'll say like, I'm really wondering if my child has ADHD. I'm also wondering, because sometimes I see like, it seems really hard for him to remember things like, do, does he have a memory problem? Is there something going on with memory? And I love it when I have those kinds of questions because I take those and I actually put them in the report and I answer them with the assessment information from that I've collected. And then I think it really helps make the report a more useful document because there were specific questions. We took the assessment data and we answered those questions and it gives people uh, a way of understanding this student and, and aspects of their learning profile. The other thing that's really important to be able to gather in this initial discussion is relevant background information. Some of this would be developmental history at what age, a common question, it's almost always asked, at what age did your child start talking, saying their first words, anything about language, because so many learning disorders are language-based. And so we know that if there are some, some lags in development, uh, if language started a little bit later than is typically expected, that maybe that's a, a hint or a signal that there is something going on. Um, so we definitely wanna know more about developmental history. Um, we want to know about family history. Um, is there a family history of learning disorders or language difficulties, attention problems? Um, depending on you know which generation we're talking about, sometimes if it's a grandparent, um, you know there won't have been a formal assessment, but sometimes the grandparent is known to have had be very disorganized and kind of you know. Um, like a forgetful, absent-minded professor sort of thing. And so we get little hints that, oh, okay, so maybe there's something genetically in the family that has to do with inattention or executive function weaknesses or something like that. 
Um, so we definitely want to gather information about family history. We know a lot of learning disorders and attention difficulties are uh, genetically based and, you know, can uh, happen within families. So it's definitely a, an important factor to consider. Um, I typically will ask about eating and sleeping, which seems perhaps really a little bit strange, um, but sleeping in particular is actually something that um, has a huge impact on learning, uh, but also on attention. And, and part of the goal of gathering this information is to be able to um, rule in or rule out the possibility, the likelihood that the pattern of data that we're getting from the assessment is a true disorder of some kind versus Hmm, there are some environmental issues that are going on that we need to take into account and maybe address first. And then once those things are better controlled, we can see, are we still, is this child still struggling in some way, um, which then gives us more confidence that a diagnosis we might be making is, is going to be an accurate reflection of them and what, what they're going through at that time. Um, beyond kind of those uh, sort of background, developmental history, family history, and things of that nature, I mean, a medical kind of a little bit of a medical history, nothing too in depth, uh, but we do want to know if there's been any major illnesses, injuries or hospitalizations. Has a child had a concussion before? So there or repeated ear infections is another one that can we know can interfere with the development of um, some of the abilities related to being able to learn to read later in school. So we want to look at some of those things. Um, and then beyond that, we want to take a look at and, and get a feel for the kid just as a person. As I mentioned, you know, a psychoeducational assessment is really about trying to capture the whole child and all the different factors that may be having an impact on their learning or their performance at school. Um, so we want to know, like, what are their interests and do they do any extracurricular activities? Um, what's their temperament like or their personality or their disposition? You know, kids who are kind of glass half full and happy go lucky and things roll off their back that's a really different kind of kid who's struggling in school in terms of the way that they're going to interpret their experiences and also the way they're going to respond to people wanting to help them um, compared to a child who may be glass half empty and who may you know feel very feel actually sadly very threatened by having struggles in school and maybe thinking that they're just not capable and not knowing that with the right support, they can become more capable and be more successful. Um, but a lot of these things, uh, you know, have to do with um, their disposition or temperament or personality and how they see the world and their place in it. So understanding that is an important part of being able to ultimately understand the child and their needs uh, and to be able to make appropriate recommendations to support them. And then finally, we definitely want to get more information about school history, some of their learning experiences, things that were tried if they were struggling in the past, what worked, what didn't work, um, if they've had any prior assessments, um, who did those, when did they happen, you know, ideally I like to get access to the report so that I can summarize it in my assessment report. And if they've had any treatment or intervention and how that went, was it successful? Who did it for how long? So that we have a complete picture of who this child is um, before we even actually meet them. And oftentimes by the end of this initial discussion, I'll say to parents, well, I'm starting to get a really, a really good mental picture of your child. And then I'm looking forward to meeting them because I start to get an idea of who this person might be and what they might be like. And I think the other piece for me um, that I think is important with this initial, initial discussion is to set this up as a collaborative process. At the end of the day, no one is more of an expert on your child than you. You may not know what you know because you don't have perhaps professional training and assessment, um, but you typically as a parent or guardian, know your child best. And I think part of my job as a school psychologist doing a psychoeducational assessment is to um, take what you know and kind of, you know, maybe reframe it in some ways to, to fit in with my professional training um, and uh, to be able to use that information to guide parts of the assessment process. Um, and to work with you so that together we're coming up with the best understanding of your child and, and how to support them moving forward. Because again, 
typically with an assessment, it's rare that we don't make a diagnosis because most of the time when someone gets referred, there is something going on and there's a, a good reason to be doing this assessment. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we get to the point of talking about recommendations and making a plan, um, you know, I think having that collaboration, I think makes a really big difference. And then there's always um, a little bit of, you know, administrative stuff, ethical stuff, consent forms, um, making sure you understand what you're embarking on and that you're comfortable with that and you're signing off on it. And then if we need to speak with anybody else in your child's world, you know, we need to get consent from you to be able to do that. So all of those things get covered in this initial discussion. And based on all of that, then I'm in a position, any psychologist would be in a position to plan the assessment, to know beyond looking at kind of general intelligence and academic achievement, which are the two basic parts, what else do we need to be looking at to be able to give you something that at the end of the day is going to address your concerns and be the most useful to you? So that's a lot that happens in that hour, hour and a half discussion. And then following that, um, you know, now that I've got an idea of your child, I have a good sense of what the concerns are. I'm starting now to plan what I want to do in the assessment to address those questions and concerns. Um, we would have an initial assessment appointment with the child. This one's an important one because it's the first time often that the child uh, is meeting the, the school psychologist for the assessment. Um, if it's their first assessment, they may be feeling nervous, um, sometimes anxious, actually. Um, sometimes uh, they have questions of their own that they'd like to have answered. Um, and they don't necessarily know what to expect when they come in. And sometimes they hear the word test somehow in somewhere in this whole process, it comes to their attention. It's a test, which for a kid is school and it's pass or fail. And there's a lot of, you know, anxiety or stress or worry associated with that, um, as well as perhaps judgment on some level. Um, but I always, you know, take the first 15, 20 minutes of the first assessment appointment. And it's all about developing rapport making sure the child is feeling comfortable, if they're feeling nervous, helping them relax. I actually once had to do deep breathing with a student because she was so anxious. It was actually clearly having a neg negative impact on her task performance. So we stopped and took some time to just kind of regroup before proceeding. Um, and so any psychologist is going to take the time to do that and to make sure the child is feeling comfortable, that they also, I mean, in an assessment, you have to be able to take risks and you're showing some vulnerability. Um, so to have a little bit of trust in this person that you're with and a, a strong rapport can go a long way in, in terms of making the assessment um, go as well as it can. Um, so this would be the first kind of assessment appointment. And then typically, I mean, there's a second one. In general, most psychologists will just do these as two sort of two to three hour assessment appointments. On rare occasions, I understand sometimes people will do it as a full day and they'll do a morning and then an afternoon. In my opinion, and I think most psychologists would agree with this, it's a, it's a very long day. Um, and I even some of my older students who I do assessments with, well, at the end of the morning will be like exhausted and just want to go home and go to bed they really work hard and they have to put a lot of effort into at least some of the things that we're doing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't all come super easily. So I, I think doing it as two half day assessment appointments is ideal because then we're getting in the morning, uh, we're getting the best out of the student in terms of their um, level of attention and they're not tired from having been at school for half a day. They're really refreshed and kind of ready to tackle the things that are being presented to them. And in these two appointments, we'd be administering standardized measures for the most part, um, and sometimes informal measures if those things will give us important pieces of information to understand the child, and maybe we'll speak a little bit to make recommendations um, or you know, how we're going to move forward in supporting the child. Mostly it's going to be standardized. And that's where those scores and the interpretation and understanding what these things actually mean comes in, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Occasionally, I will say we need to do um, a third assessment appointment if a student is, um, you know, sometimes they work super carefully, they don't work fast, uh, 
we've got X number of things we've got to get through. They all need a break, typically about mid morning. I mean, they just need to get up and move a little bit. Sometimes they're hungry, they need a snack. So we don't always get through everything that we need to do in the two appointments. And so a third shorter appointment might be necessary. But once we have all of our assessment information and I'm able to then do an initial interpretation, write a draft of the report, get down some recommendations that I'm considering, that would be when a feedback discussion would happen with the parent or guardian. Um, initially, anyways, it would be with the parent or guardian. Later on, we might do another meeting um, with the student that would either include or not include the parent guardian, depends on what's gonna work best for the student, the child. Um, but the initial sort of feedback discussion with a parent or guardian is where we would go through all the assessment results um, and present an interpretation, what this tells us about this student um, and what diagnosis this leads to or is consistent with. And again, at this point, we've set it up as a collaborative process. At this point, again, we're asking or I'm asking parents for feedback. Does this resonate for you? Does this sound like your child? Does it make sense? Do you have questions about it? Um, is there anything coming up now that I've presented all this information to you that didn't occur to you before, but you think might be important? And so sometimes new things come up and that helps with kind of, again, solidifying the interpretation of the information. And then we talk about recommendations and as much as possible, try to move into making a plan. Um, generating a plan of action so that we know once this process is done and the parent has the finalized report that they've got a working document and they know kind of what their next steps are going to be. Um, Roberta, are there any? No, no questions. Okay. No, I, I uh, put a note in the chat box that if anybody has questions, um, before we get to the Q&A, please uh, let us know. And if you could pop those into the chat. Mark, Perfect. take them. Okay, good. Um, so in terms of um, the scores, what do those scores actually mean? I think this is probably the thing, at least in my experience and from feedback I've gotten from parents, that probably causes the most stress. <laughs> Because a lot of reports really, well, they talk about numbers that don't necessarily make a lot of sense unless you know kind of how to interpret them. Um, most reports will include or refer to percentiles. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about what these things mean and how to understand them. Um, and I wanted to start first by just backing up a little bit. And I don't know if you can see my cursor running along this bell-shaped curve, um, but this is a normal distribution. And so when we gather you know, a measurement or some kind of piece of information um, from a large enough group of people, we can often put it down, plot it, and get this kind of a distribution of scores or performances. So it could be things like height, if you were to measure people, um, and then put it down, you'd actually get a distribution of scores that looked very much like this, where most people are gonna fall somewhere in the middle here between these, well, actually it's a little bit wider even than these two blue bars. Um, it's really from that one to this one. So most people would fall there. And then as you move to the right of that center line, um, you're moving into above average um, or higher than average scores, and then moving below that line, you're getting into below average, lower average scores. Um, so all of the different standardized measures that we use um, have been designed to work this way. And so the way that the, the norms work, um, when they're plotted, they fall exactly in this kind of a distribution. Um, and so this allows us to be able to take a child's score on a particular standardized measure, compare them to other children of the same age or in the same grade, depending on which group you're gonna use, an age-based group or a grade-based group, um, and to compare that child's score to those other children and to know, are they in fact kind of average? Are they in the middle with most other children? 
um, are they falling above? Uh, and so they're showing a strength in something or are they follow, falling below and showing a weakness in something? And to what extent is it a strength or a weakness? Is it a little bit of a weakness uh, or is it very much a weakness? In which case it's gonna have a different, possibly a different impact on their functioning in school or some other aspect of life. Um, so the blue bars that I've included on this normal distribution, the, the bell curve, um, actually are a little bit inside of these other blue line, uh, these other lines. Um, and basically they correspond to the 25th and on the upper side, the 75th percentile. And those, that's really the band of percentiles that is considered average. So if a child is getting a score that places them anywhere between the 25th and the 75th percentile, they're considered average, typical for their age or grade. And percentiles really mean that they're performing the same as or better than, you know, 25% of the students or 50% of the students or whatever their percentile ranking is. So that's really how we interpret that statistic. And the nice thing about percentiles and why they're so widely used is that, um, you know, they function very much the same way for all uh, standardized tasks. So the 50th percentile on one standardized measurement measure will be can be interpreted in the same way on another one for the most part. So it will be average no matter what. And so there's that kind of ability then to compare performances across different measures, which is partly how we're able to then get into a learning profile, like a pattern of strengths and weaknesses for a student. Other statistics are sometimes reported in an assessment report. So a scaled score or a standard score, typically if they're used, they would be, you know, an interpretation and explanation of them would be included. Um, in my experience, almost always people are reporting percentiles. So it's because it's so easy and it's easier to interpret and it, it allows for, like I said, those comparisons across different tasks. So it's, it's just much, um, much easier to use overall. Occasionally, um, I will see grade equivalents. So um, a score that reflects the, you know, a child's performance on a task has a grade equivalent of, you know, 4.5, let's say, and that would be the fifth month of the fourth grade. Um, for academic measurements, sometimes like reading, spelling, writing, math, those kinds of academic tasks, it seems like it would make sense to report grade equivalents, but they're actually quite easily misinterpreted. Um, from a statistical point of view, they're not always reliable in terms of what they tell you. It depends on how the test was actually developed. Um, and you can't compare them across tasks. So if you're doing one particular measurement uh, for reading, but you're using a whole other measurement to look at spelling and sentence writing, uh, the grade equivalents on those two tasks are not going to be comparable just because of the way the tests themselves were developed. So it leads to more confusion often and lack of clarity, um, and in fact, can even be quite misleading. So most of the time people don't, I think, report the grade equivalents anymore. Um, but I wanted to bring it up because sometimes it's, it's they're still there. The other thing that I just wanted to point out um, is 25th percentile, I know sometimes seems to parents to be quite low. <laughs> I mean, even 50th percentile, I've had many parents say that's not good because I think oftentimes we're thinking 50% which like on a test at school would be considered a failing mark. Um, but this is really, you know, not the same as just straight up percentage. It's not a reflection of like they got 50% right or something like that. It's really their performance on this particular task was the same or better than, you know, 50% of the kids in their group, in their age group or in their grade level group. Um, and so, I think it's important to keep in mind 25th to 75th percentile is average. It's, you know, reflective of typical development. Um, we have little bands on to the left and to the right of the 25th and 75th percentile section, 
that are called low average and high average because they're a little bit below and a little bit above. Um, so all of that for me as a psychologist and having worked as long as I have in the field and having done intervention with as many students as I, I've done, um, anything around this, these areas is totally fine. Kids, um, I mean, and I've now assessed kids who have grown up and actually now have children of their own. <laughs> So I've, I've been able to watch them grow up literally and go through elementary school, through high school, in some cases through grad school. Um, and so I know, having tracked and worked with some of these individuals for so long, I kind of know where they started and where they ended up. And I, I just, I feel like it's so important to reassure parents that um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being in the 25th to the 75th percentile. Um, it's not going to be an indication of, you know, that they can't do certain things in life. I think there are a lot of other factors that come into play. Um, so I just really wanted to emphasize that. And so kind of getting close to the end of the hour that I was planning to talk and then opening it up to more general questions and we can have more of a discussion. But um, how does an assessment help my child? At the end of the day, you know, what, like what can we expect to get from this process that's going to be helpful? I think first and foremost, as you can now see, it identifies and documents strengths and weaknesses. Um, and this is really helpful for being able to understand, you know, what you're seeing as the child's experiences of school or what they're talking about in terms of their experience of school, whether they, you know, are getting stomach aches and trying to avoid school because of the things that are challenging. With an assessment now, you're able to sort of know what those weaknesses are and be able to reassure them about how those things are going to change over time with the right intervention. Equally, I think you're now in a position to talk about their strengths and their abilities and the things that they already can do and that are just fine, which can be very reassuring. Um, and so it's it enables us to just have a better understanding, um, both of that child's experiences and also of our experiences with a child. So if there are things that have been coming up in work we do with a child or our own child as we're doing homework with them that we haven't been able to understand or explain to ourselves before, sometimes we're able to do that once we've had this psychoeducational assessment. And I think that, you know, that's huge, really, that can be a game changer. Um, I think, you know, certainly an assessment provides a learning profile for the child. So again, pattern of strengths and weaknesses, but also all the other factors that come into play that can help us understand how this child learns. You know, why is this kid who struggles so much with reading so able to persist for hours, like, or for such long periods of time and not give up? Uh, well, it's because temperamentally, this kid is like, has got grit. They don't give up. They're very perseverant. Uh, and that's a really important quality to recognize and celebrate and also use as we're moving forward and trying to help a kid. Um, so having a learning profile and really having a good understanding of how they learn and the factors and um, other, you know, things that come into play, I think is really critical and certainly a benefit of an assessment. Um, again, it can explain difficulties the child has been having. Kid is having difficulty with math, but we don't really know why until we do an assessment. Is it because they have ADHD and they're impulsive and they're not stopping to read things carefully? Uh, or look at the, you know, addition versus the subtraction sign, um, which can be positive and negative when they're in high school. And then, of course, that leads to a lot of other issues in math. Um, or is it um, that they, in fact, have a, a nonverbal learning disorder and they've got some pretty important weaknesses in the visual spatial domain that make math learning on some kind of bigger conceptual level quite challenging for them? And then we need to take a different approach. Um, Roberta, I just saw that you raised your hand. <laughs> I did. We actually have had a few questions come in just in the last minute. Okay. So, would it be okay to ask these questions at this sure. point? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. So the first one has come in from Carolyn, and she mentions that you said there's nothing wrong with being between the 25th and 75th percentile. What if the child is below the 25th percentile in many areas? Since uh, you follow kids for many years, how do these kids fare? 
So that is a great question. Um, and I was actually just talking about this with a colleague recently. So there are some students who um, fall, and I guess, you know, part of the answer to that question depends on how far below the 25th percentile the student is performing and across how many different domains of functioning. That's an important thing. Um, but I definitely know that there are students who, you know, can function sort of a, between the 16th and the 25th percentile and be kind of in that range of functioning across a lot of different intellectual and academic domains, um, but who can do quite well in school, like who can, I mean, graduate high school, absolutely. They may need to be particularly hardworking students, um, but we've worked with students who kind of are in that range of, of performance on assessment measures. And um, I think if they've got kind of the right temperament, um, you know, I, I can think of several students who were very able to be very successful. And in fact, one student who I, I've known for quite a long time um, was an honor roll student. Um, and I know there was a time when nobody would have predicted that. But this student happened to become very strategic, um, knew how to use her resources, both just her own tools and strategies um, that she was open to learning, but also the people in her life, who to go to to help her with revising and editing an essay, who to go to if you know she needed a little pick me up and some cheerleading to keep her going with something that was hard. Um, and she used all of that to her benefit and was enormously successful. So I guess the answer is it's a little bit hard to say for sure without knowing more detail, but I, I wouldn't say, you know, there needs to be a concern that this is a student who could not move on academically with the right support. <laughs> hey, thanks, Marlene. We have um, another sort of, it's got a couple of parts, um, some questions from Linda Sullivan. And the first aspect is, does this psychoeducational assessment also provide suggestions or accommodations, or is that typically set up at the school? And can you give some examples of common accommodations? Okay. Um, so definitely, I think most uh, psychologists would include recommendations for accommodations um, and other kinds of resources. Um, so that when that document goes to the school, as it typically needs to in order to get those things, um, then the school has the information and they also have the official like recommendation from the psychologist that these things should be put into place or considered. Um, not There are situations where sometimes a psychologist will recommend something, but I know particularly at the post-secondary level, um, that's not a guarantee that the this, this student will be able to obtain that accommodation. There are some, you know, different things that happen, especially at the post-secondary level um, compared to elementary and high school. Elementary school, I think students can actually have an individual education plan without actually having an assessment, especially in the public sector, because there's more of a response to intervention kind of model. And so they'll often try to put some things, some supports in place see how the student responds and if things seem to improve then great we don't need to do an assessment if they don't or if new things come up well then we'll assess and maybe put in um, a different kind of level of support and intervention and that's where the psychoeducational assessment would be helpful um yeah so that was part of the question yeah um yes and um i'm just cognizant do you have any other um slides that you want to go through because we've had a few more questions come in okay good that's what i was hoping would happen yeah so I think this, is my, this is my last slide okay. so maybe i'll finish it quickly and then we'll move into kind of just general q a because it seems like people are now coming up with questions which is great yeah, then we've had about we have about three in here okay yeah. um but linda's question the second part was examples of accommodations I remembered that uh, finally. Um, so accommodations would be things like extra time for tests and exams, uh, being able to write in a separate room, um, being able to use a computer, um, sometimes with a text to voice and or voice to text software to support reading and or writing. 
um, things of that nature. Those would be some examples of accommodations. Um, I think those are the most common ones that I can think of. So, so before we move on to the other questions, um, just finishing up on, I think this is my last slide. Um, so in terms of what else an assessment can do to help my child, um, I think one of the things that is really can be life-changing actually for some students, and I, I don't want to overstate it, but I mean, in my experience, it's been quite, quite life-changing for a few kids, is it that it demystifies their experiences. Um, I know sometimes parents legitimately have a concern that when a child finds out that they have a disorder of some kind that relates to learning, that that can be demoralizing for them. And I defer to parents when they feel that way. Um, I don't insist that we, you know, that the child knows or anything like that, because I think there are kids for whom it would be demoralizing and, and they, it just won't help them to know, uh, and rather we'll support them and they know that they're having some challenges, but that's kind of enough for them to know. But I certainly have had kids um, who, when they found out that they had, you know, um, a learning disorder in written expression, um, and that with that, part of that included some memory weaknesses um, and what have you, for them, it was just like, oh, it was like a relief. They, they now understood something about the experiences that they'd been having. It reassured them that they were capable and, you know, in some of their words, they weren't dumb. Um, and it gave them a path forward. It gave them a sense of understanding of, okay, all of this stuff is fine. And here are the specific things that are not so fine right now. And I need to somehow get the things that I need in order to improve those things that are, that are weak right now or challenging for me. So it can really demystify a student's experiences. Um, and I think can be very reassuring ultimately for some of them. And then finally, it can make some resources and accommodations available to a child, which we've been talking about. And like I said, um, for some things, schools need to have documentation on file. Um, otherwise, they're not really permitted to provide those things. And so the psychoeducational assessment can help a child in that respect. Great. So here we are, Q&A, let's discuss. <laughs> okay, great, Marlene. How about... Uh... I'll pose a couple of other questions that have come in so far. Okay. Um, so this is also one from Linda Sullivan who posed the last question. Um, what do you recommend if someone disagrees with an assessment or doesn't see their child, see in quotes, their child in the result? Are second opinions common? I've certainly had situations come up where I was the second opinion probably people have done second opinions on my assessments. I don't know. <laughs> that never came back to me. Um, but I do know I've had some that um, either right from the get go, they said, you know, we've had an assessment, it happened at this, you know, at this time, um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, sometimes it's more recently than that. Um, and it's really actually important to mention that when you're seeking um, an assessment, that will be used as a, as a second opinion, because some of the measures that we use actually can't be repeated until at least one year has passed. Otherwise, what you get is a distortion in the student's performance. It can be inflated, and then it can be very misleading in terms of what their strengths and needs actually are. So it's important to, to disclose that at the beginning. Having said that, um, the parent is totally able to say, so I don't want you to see the other assessment report. I want you to just like, let's treat this as a whole new situation. And after we've done this new assessment with you, then we can maybe share the other report and discuss, or I'll tell you more about where I disagreed or what my concerns were with the first assessment. Um, so absolutely, I think if a parent is concerned and they really feel like the assessment hasn't captured their child accurately, um, and, and you know, there will be many times when the parent will be correct about that. Psychologists are human, something may not have gone the way it should have in an assessment, and perhaps something was missed. Um, I think it's definitely worthwhile for a parent to know that they can get a second opinion, and it could be really helpful, but I think it's important for them to know too that they need to disclose it just so that that newer assessment is going to be done at the right time and provide accurate and reliable information. Okay, great. Thanks, Marlene. Um, our next question comes from Gizu, who has asked, what about cases where a child has one 
or a few scores that are very high and one or a few that are very low. So there's a lot of variation. What kind of impact can that have? So that is not an uncommon situation in assessments. Um, and I think when that happens, one thing that uh, the psychologist, I guess, would be bearing in mind is we never want to overly rely on one data point, right? We're always sort of looking at patterns. And when we get a pattern where there's a lot of variability like that, particularly within one domain, so let's say working memory or visual spatial abilities, and we see out of the three tasks that the child did that was within this domain, you know, one was really low, you know, and the other two were higher or high or whatever the discrepancy is. Um, and I think when that happens, you know, what I try to do as much as possible, and there are some limitations to this, is I try to look for other data points, either within the assessment that we've already done, or I, I will administer other tasks to try to gather more information to tease apart what's going on. Um, and so I think when you get those kind of really variable profiles, um, you need to kind of like look at all of that, try to hypothesize what, what might be going on and then plan other ways of gathering information that can help to clarify the pattern. Um, yeah, because you just, you don't wanna be relying on a data point to draw a big conclusion about a kid. Um, and we know that sometimes going with like a, an overall score um, where we've got that variability, sometimes that overall score doesn't accurately portray the student either because the differences get washed out when you start to take the average, which is usually what the kind of like the overall score is. I don't know. Hopefully that was a clear enough explanation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we have one other uh, question from uh, Gizu. She's asking, what are your thoughts on RTI? Might be a broad question. I'm not sure. <laughs> so response to intervention. I mean, I think, you know, in theory, um, it certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that I'm not sure yet that at least in the English system, so anyone who is a teacher in the English system can certainly disagree with me and jump into the conversation, but I, I'm not sure that um, how well implemented RTI is at this point. Um, but I think when it's done properly, because it's a, it should be really a systematic way of observing a student, sort of identifying some of their needs, implementing intervention to see, does that, does that do the trick? Does the kid improve? Am I hitting the right note with these interventions for that kid's needs? If all of that happens and it's done very carefully and systematically, then, you know, I think it can actually um, well, it's certainly a way to do early intervention, which um, is something I think is critical. And it's one reason why I think parents, especially when their kid is younger and the school isn't yet identifying a concern, but the parent is feeling uncomfortable. That's why I encourage you to trust your gut um, and maybe consider pursuing a, a, um, a psychoeducational assessment or at least a consultation um, because if we can nip things in the bud, it's so much better for so many different kinds of learning challenges. And it really prevents kids from um, struggling more than they need to really. So, and reading is one of the areas where absolutely we have tons of research um, when kids can't rhyme, when they're you know not able to hear or perceive or manipulate the sounds in words, um, doing all that wordplay that preschoolers will, will do that makes them laugh so much, like Harry, scary, Mary, ah, you know, they think these things are so funny. Um, if they're not doing some of those things, that's an early sign that maybe there's dyslexia. Um, and so if we were to identify that and then intervene with the right kind of effective support, that could go a long way in helping that kid minimize the difficulty learning to read and then be able to sort of be on par with their peers, um, it can really change the outcome in many ways and certainly the journey of going through school. So I think RTI has a lot of promise, um, and I, but I think it really has to be done carefully and systematically to be effective. It, it, ultimately, it is a form of assessment. It's just less formal than a psychoeducational assessment. Great, thank you, Marlene. Um, we have another question from Marguerite uh, Stratford. 
it, this is her first question, but I mean another question. Yeah. So she's asking, could you speak more about the homogeneous versus the heterogeneous results in the subtests of, say, the WISC testing? Okay. So I think um, that probably Marguerite is referring to, so within the WISC, which is the test of general intelligence, that is the standard used in psychoeducational and neuropsychological assessments to gather information about a child's cognitive or intellectual abilities. Um, basically, we have five different domains um, that the WISC captures. So verbal comprehension, which is much about kind of being able to use language on some level to reason and to explain the meaning of words. Um, visual uh, spatial abilities, which is much, you know, more about kind of nonverbal tasks and visual spatial, like uh, mentally representing that information. Um, fluid reasoning, which is very much about being able to look at some information that's visually presented, figure out a pattern or a rule, um, and then use that information to solve a new problem. Um, and we have working memory is the fourth domain. So the ability to hold some information in immediate memory and actively manipulate or use some of it at the same time. And then finally processing speed, which is about how fast and how accurately a child can process you know, fairly simple, you know, visual information. So within those domains, we typically have two or three standardized tasks that we administer that then allow us to get a domain score, an overall score for that domain. And so we can have variability within the domain, um, but we can also have variability across those five domains. So a child might be achieving in the average or above average range for verbal comprehension, um, but maybe, you know, low average or below average in visual spatial. And so that that can be a significant discrepancy. Um, and that can be part of how the, the information that we use to make a diagnosis. So in that actually in that particular example that I just happened to give, if we saw evidence in other areas, um, partly from background information and maybe from other tasks that the child um, had other difficulties associated with weaknesses in visual spatial abilities. Uh, for instance, difficulty with like team sports, um, kind of their own body in space and being able to orient themselves that way. Maybe with math, uh, particularly more of the conceptual side of math. Um, maybe with some of the nonverbal sides uh, of communication. Those would all be indicators perhaps of a diagnosis of nonverbal learning disorder because the strengths or abilities are really in the uh, verbal domain, the weaknesses are in the visual spatial domain and affecting other things that are typically a part of that profile. Uh, and so we get an overall pattern based on all that information that might be consistent with a nonverbal learning disorder diagnosis. Um, so I guess the variability between the domains can sometimes help with diagnosis. Um, but again, sometimes we need to gather more information to know, uh, to, to see, you know, what these, what these differences are actually telling us. And if it's something that's a part of a larger pattern um, that we can document or not, it can be just an anomaly. But something happened with that particular task or that particular domain on that day, and it's not an accurate reflection of the student. So it's kind of the need to kind of look critically at things and figure out what might be going on and then how to proceed in terms of making sure what you're, you're documenting as an overall profile is, is um, reliable and valid. Okay, great. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you. We have uh, three more questions lined up at the moment. We have one from Carolyn and then the next one will be from Anne. So Carolyn is asking, how do multiple disabilities impact the assessment? For example, ADHD, ASD, plus speech language disorder. Can the psychoeducational assessment differentiate these different diagnoses? Um, so the psychoeducational assessment, well, so it wouldn't really do anything in terms of the ASD diagnosis, the autism spectrum disorder, um, because that would have been assessed by a specialist in those forms, forms of assessment, um, which a psychoeducational assessment does not do, and I don't do. Like, you really have to have specialized training. 
Um, in terms of the speech language weaknesses and the ADHD, um, to some extent, it would pick up on that because, I mean, with a psychoeducational assessment, we can diagnose ADHD. We can't diagnose the speech and language issue because, of course, that requires the expertise of a speech language pathologist. Um, and I will say that, you know, I certainly have had kids having had the opportunity to work with speech language pathologists quite closely over the last 15 or so years and having assessed many of the kids who do see a speech language pathologist here at the center. It's very interesting because we do have some language based measures, for instance, on the test of general intelligence. So there's the verbal comprehension domain, which has two particular subtests, um, one of which is about expressive vocabulary. The other one is more of an abstract verbal reasoning task. And I will say that sometimes I've worked with kids who have a diagnosed learning disorder, but who actually um, achieve average or typical scores in the verbal comprehension domain. And it seems like it's a discrepancy given that they have a language disorder diagnosis, but in fact, when you look at the demands of the verbal comprehension subtests, um, the verbal reasoning one in particular, it's very formulaic. And as long as you can identify what's common um, between the two things that you're meant to kind of abstractly reason about, you don't actually have to use a lot of words to get a good answer, to, to actually get a full point answer. Um, and so although vocabulary is a little bit different and maybe harder to kind of explain, but at the end of the day, I think the test of general intelligence, because it's um, meant to be measures of aspects of intelligence and not language in its full form, at all its depth, um, we often will see those kinds of different sorts of results. Um, so I know that sometimes I'm gonna get kids with a language disorder who actually perform just fine in the verbal comprehension domain. It doesn't mean that they don't have a language disorder. It just means that these two particular subtests actually aren't really measuring language as well as what a speech language pathologist would use. Um, having said that, when we look at more of the academic performance, we'll probably see a lot of evidence of their language issues coming up in reading comprehension or written expression sentence level writing, things of maybe math problem solving because of the words. So we'll definitely see evidence of that there. Um, and so in that sense, it will differentiate a little bit and show some of those things. I will say my own personal bias is I don't love um, putting a lot of diagnoses on a kid. I really think very carefully before I, I do that myself. Um, so we know kids with ASD, typically part of their profile is executive function weaknesses, part of which is attention. And we often know that they have language issues by definition, by, by virtue of having autism spectrum disorder. So unless those difficulties are up and above what is typically expected for their ASD profile, then I would probably just say, okay, they have ASD. And as part of that, their own learning profile includes some weaknesses in language, difficulties with executive functioning, including attention. Um, and I would you know, do the psychoed assessment and then look at their more, more of their learning profile to try to figure out how can we support them moving forward? Um, are there memory issues or other things that haven't yet been assessed that we can pick up on that we might need to intervene with? Okay, great. Thank you, Marlene. Um, and we have a question from Anne Stewart. She's asking, what about kids learning in their second language? How do you evaluate their true academic potential? I'm thinking about making a choice for which language of high school education to pursue. Okay, excellent question. And of course, unique almost really <laughs> to come back. <laughs> um, so typically the standard of practice is if a student, um, and we'll just go with the example of an Anglophone student comes from an essentially Anglophone family um, who has been going to French school, French elementary school, you know, all of their lives, and now is getting close to the end and, you know, like this person trying to determine whether the child should go into a French high school or an English high school. In that particular case, what we generally do um, is we will assess the cognitive abilities of the child in their mother tongue, their strongest language, so in this case, English. But of course, because they've been schooled in French, we're gonna want to assess their academic achievement in French, their language of instruction. 
because that will give us the most accurate representation of where their basic academic skills are at. Without formal teaching in English, um, then you know it wouldn't be fair to assess their academic skills in English um, necessarily because they haven't had formal instruction. And so any, any below average performances, which we would expect under those circumstances, can't be attributed to a learning disorder because there's been lack of educational opportunity. They haven't been in an English elementary school to learn in English. So that's one of the criteria that is used to um, rule in or rule out a learning disorder is educational opportunity. If the child hasn't had the opportunity to learn something, then it's a weakness that we can document cannot be attributed to a disorder, a learning disorder. At, the, at that point, it has to be attributed to their lack of opportunity to learn. And then once you address that, then you can kind of reevaluate and determine if in fact there is some, something else going on. Um, in the case of this example of an Anglophone kid in French elementary school, if the child has had some struggles in elementary school, we could do that kind of bilingual assessment and see what happens academically for them. Um, and then it may be that we're able to document a learning disorder that way, that they're performing unexpectedly lower than they should be given their cognitive profile. Um, and there's no reason, especially if they're toward the end of elementary school because they've been in French school, uh, French school setting long enough to have acquired the language. So that shouldn't be having an impact as a second language kind of situation. So there are definitely some ways to look at those situations um, and to proceed carefully, but uh, there's certainly some well-documented and researched ways to assess those students to know kind of more clearly what's going on. Great, Marlene, thank you. Um, we're approaching 9.25, so we have about five minutes left. Um, we have one other question. I'm just wondering if you have time for this or energy. Okay. I think I can manage one more question. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this will be our, our last question. Um, do you think nonverbal learning disability, NVLD, should be added to the DSM? And do you think it is likely to be added to a newer edition? I feel like this is coming from a psychologist <laughs> or a very informed parent. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's a good question. I, yeah, I mean, I do, my gut is that NVLD does exist. Um, I mean, one of my uh, earliest um, intervention clients, actually, I, I worked with her and on the intervention side and actually then did some assessment with her as well. But um, she is a student who, in my mind, is always like the textbook example of a nonverbal learning disorder. She just ticked off all the boxes. And I, I took a class, actually, a neuropsychology class, where a, a part of what we were learning, one section of the course, was about nonverbal learning disorder. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's not in the DSM. I, I don't know why it's not in the DSM, but I have to say I don't necessarily love the DSM anyways, because I find it just doesn't capture some of the kids learning profiles that I that I see certainly and that seem to make sense in reality. So I'm not I'm not loving the DSM. Um, so I don't and I don't know if it'll appear in the next issue like uh, it would be great if it did. Um, I mean, in fact, recently, and I do this regularly just to keep on top of things and make sure I, I know what I'm talking about, but I was trying to do some research to see what, what's the latest on nonverbal learning disorder. And I purchased a book, which um, I haven't quite finished on all about that. Uh, so there does seem to be evidence that it is a disorder that is distinct. Um, and I certainly do feel like I've worked with kids who very much fit that, that uh, the criteria of a nonverbal learning disorder. Um, and I think at the end of the day, if it's telling us something meaningful and it's giving us a path forward and we're able to do something that then supports the student and makes some positive changes for them, then I think it's something real um, on that level. So we'll have to wait to see for the, I guess, the sixth edition of the DSM. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you, Marlene. Thanks for answering that question. And I'm going to pass it over to um, Alice now. 
Um, Sana Nakli, the president of MCLD, was hoping that she'd be able to thank you personally, um, Marlene, but she's having some uh, internet connection problems. Her <laughs> It's not very stable, and hopefully I won't get cut off, or I'll have to pass the baton on to Roberta. Um, but on behalf of, I think, um, not only the organization MCLD, but all the people who attended this evening, um, I think you really proved two things again to me tonight. Um, one was that you're very knowledgeable about the topic of um, learning assessments. And it came across in the way that people were able to ask some fairly complex questions, but you were able to answer them in a way that we could all understand no matter what our training is. Um, so I think, again, really thank you for your knowledge. But there's something else I would like to thank you even more for. And that is um, when I listen to you talk, I really have the sense that you like your clients, both the students and the parents. And you said a couple of things that I thought were so valuable. One was for parents to listen to their intuition. And that is, I think, a very empowering message for any parent of a child with a learning disability. Um, but also your sensitivity um, in terms of the student and the anxiety and the time you take to make them feel comfortable on the rapport. And I think, you know, knowledge is a great thing, but I also think the compassion and the concern um, for the clients really comes across. And I think uh, it's a real positive contribution um, to the community of uh, people with learning disabilities. So again, Marlene, uh, unfortunately you did such a great job that we're probably gonna be bothering you again <laughs> and asking you to talk about another topic. And um, I have a secret, I know how to, how to bribe Marlene now. She likes dark fruitcakes and I know where to get them. So maybe that'll be my next bribe. But again, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Those were lovely words, and I'm really happy if it was helpful to people. So thank you. Welcome.